to lecture, and we'll start that up in just a couple of minutes. I'll, So I'm going to continue, and I think this, depending on your particular mindset, this might be more fun for some of you. Uh, what I want to talk about now is doing the design of these molecular materials and really tell you about some, some results we have and some, some approaches that one can take to try to make better materials for organic photovoltaic um, devices. So, you'll recall that we had a couple of design things that we need to do. So, again, I'm coming at this from the point of view of working with chemists who want to make materials and want a 20% efficient organic photovoltaic device. And so we've got these energy levels that we need to understand and predict well enough to decide that we've got something that's going to absorb well, so let the exocon have a good open circuit hole. You recall that we also get to get something that has a decent geometry. So nice and planar is good because they pack well and you get good hole transport. Um, less planar is not as good as it is. So this is a slide that Sean was kind enough to share with me from his, his lecture yesterday, which is thinking qualitatively what affects that band gap. Because this is kind of what we want to do in designing molecules. And we have that bond alternation affects the energy gap. And we saw this spot where the bond alternation, if you're aromatic, as you become more quinoidal, the gap goes down. Um, we also saw that there's an energy gap effect of having interring planarity. So less planar means a bigger gap. So and then there are a variety of other things that change substituents hanging off of the backbone, and that can change the gap and other things. Um, the reason I'm putting this slide up is because um, you've got to be pretty clever to guess from looking at a molecule just how much bond alternation there's going to be, how big that difference in bond length is. Um, I'm not that clever. And interring planarity, maybe you can look and say, oh, there's a proton hanging off of that six member ring and it's going to cause things to tilt. But on the other hand, if you have conjugation throughout your backbone of your molecule, that's going to tend to want to make the pi electrons in the backbone line up, which is going to tend to want to make you planar. So you have competition between the electronic structure that's trying to make you planar and maybe steric effects because there's an atom poking out on the side that's forcing you to do this. So my approach from the point of view of wanting to design materials is to say, I don't want to guess what each of these effects is. I just want to calculate the stable structure and the energetics for each molecule and go from there. So that's motivation for either it's either admitting I'm not clever or it's motivation for just doing electron expression calculations. So again, we saw that combining density functional theory and time-dependent density functional theory for gaps gives us results that correlate pretty well for a, a set of experimental values. Let's just think that this would be worth doing. Um, so the idea is going to be to extend what we're doing to large molecules, polymers, these donor acceptor systems, and use that to predict properties. So pretty much everything I'm going to tell you about when I tell you about results um, is that I'm using one of these two basis sets, 631GD, some people call it G6, 
star, or 6 to the 1 plus g star, which is useful when you have lone pairs, because lone pairs are puffy. And this plus denotes what are called diffuse functions. They're big puffy functions that allow you to get that, that lone pair. And it makes a big difference in the absolute energies of, of the Homo level that you say calculate. Um, I'm going to use a workhorse exchange correlation functional that actually I think does better B3 lip than for these large molecules than is indicated for the set of molecules that uh, Charles's paper kind of tested. The larger molecules, B3 lip seems to work pretty well um, as long as you don't have charge transfer character which we don't think anything we're doing. I actually ran Gaussian 09 to run these calculations. You can do what we're doing any any piece of code. Um, but this is just my so you know what we did. Now to see that this actually is is a worthwhile thing, um, I have gone out and calculated the properties of this material that uh, put out by Daniel's group and, and Solar that uh, ended up making a seven and a half percent solar cell efficiency. And is, are you able to see these things okay, or should we turn off the lights a little bit? You can't see them at all. And in this case, the light. This is so good. So what we have here is the gray air carbon, and we have this, this long chain, it's a, like a hexamer that calculated. And I've optimized the geometry. And one thing that's interesting if you turn this sideways is this is not super planar. Yeah, these, these elements don't exactly want to line up with each other, and so we've got a bit of a twist to the backbone. Uh, that's somewhat interesting. We'll see in a minute. Um, having calculated the geometry associated with that, let's see whether we have any hopeful understandings going on. If we look at the calculated homo orbital and lumo orbital of this thing, this is what they've come out to be. What's interesting is that they're nicely delocalized all along the back uh, That's a good thing because, as uh, we heard Mark mention at the end of his talk, in order to have good optical absorption, you want the overlap between the homo and lumo to be large. Essentially that means there's going to be a large transition dipole that allows you to absorb light. So this efficient device, just our calculations, show very delocalized orbitals. And that's kind of interesting if you think about it, because we've got twist, and typically one thinks if you've got a big twist in a, a, a chain, you break the connection between the elements of the chain. Now apparently, that uh, kind of 30 degrees that we have here is not enough to do that. Um, that is not a design kind of rule. Anything above about 20 to 25 degrees, we found in our calculations, gets right to the edge of whether or not it's going to prevent you from staying, from crossing over that. Um, so, so what? You've seen some orbitals. Um, here are the calculated absorption spectra for a whole bunch of versions of this molecule. So what I, yeah. I don't know uh, what do you need to get in the seven percent efficient of condition. So this is with I think there's seven point four percent, I think it's P seventy one, C sixty, P P C B M. Um I, do you remember what I'm talking about? Is it a fifty fifty or is it a four to one? It's a one to four. Um, yeah. Yeah, because it disperses. So um, it's kind of. Is it for the experimental for you, or you measure this? Um, the seven point four percent is experimental. So I'm taking a good material that was in the literature mm -hmm. and calculating some stuff as a way of kind of motivating the. So your result is fifty fifty experimental. Because, uh, for example, there is no fitting to the experiment. But is there boundary condition for the interface between the organic and metal? There is. That, that has nothing to do. So, so the, the results I was showing you, so I think this is a, a, a kind of, it should have been clearer. The 
calculations I'm showing are for a single oligomer, six long. Um, all I've calculated are the energy levels, the geometry of that isolated molecule, and like what the whole moon will look like. Um, I haven't used that at all to predict the efficiency of the device. The 7.4% is just a reference to what's in the literature. Like when people made an optimized device using that molecule, they got 7.4%. So there's no boundary conditions in anything I'm doing because I don't have electrodes. I don't actually even have PCM in there. So it's, that would be a great thing if I knew how to do that. Um, that actually Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah. OK. Uh, OK, cool. So we've got these nicely delocalized things, which tells us we're going to have a good absorption. Um, what I'm showing here is calculated absorption spectra for a variety of different versions of this molecule. So I'm really looking at oligomers. So I've got this we could call it a monomer, N equals one, a co-monomer, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then I can put two of them together, and that's N equals two, three and four, and so on. Um, what's plotted here, actually in real units, so this is times 10 to the fourth liters per mole centimeter, so um, is a artificially broadened version of the spectrum. So what I'm calculating is the energy and the excitation energies, and then I'm basically broadening them by a Gaussian to get the structural And this should be labeled as the wavelength in nanometers. What we see as we go from n equals 1, we've got this little fairly blue and ultraviolet absorber. n equals 2, we start to pick up absorption from there. And um, N equals 3, we move in here, 4, 5. The, the peak stops shifting as we move, but I keep getting more and more absorption. Why am I getting more and more absorption? It's got more and more electrons. And there's some absorption not just from HOMO to LUMO, but from HOMO minus 1 to LUMO plus 1 and stuff, and so that gives me extra options, and hence I have extra um, absorption. So, fine. It's worth thinking about the fact that we have this very rapid red shift, and then it sort of tails off. Does that make sense? Um, can anyone just hand wave why we see a red shift as, as I make this longer? There's just a bigger conjugated system. <coughs> so a bigger conjugated system. More delocalized electrons, lower energy. Right, more delocalized electrons, lower energy. May I ask a question, please? Um, how much better is this approach um, compared to if I say I just take the, I just count the conjugation length and treat this as a kind of particle in a box, calculate my energy state, and then also broaden it by Gaussian distribution? That can do pretty well for gap, but it won't give you the absolute energies of the, the state because that really that that type of theory, as far as I'm aware, gives you gap information more. As for the details, when we optimize the geometry and we have this twist, it's a little hard because if we're thinking in terms of a, a local type kind of way of thinking that way, um, there are these parameters that have to do with coupling as you go the single and double bonds. And the coupling is not the same if there's a different twist as you move along the thing. So you could conceivably have to take that into account. That's going to quantitatively affect your answer, if not necessarily qualitatively. Um, is there any comparison between these two approaches? Um, you know what? Sure there is. Um, I have not seen it for these push-pull materials. Um, I'll talk at the end about um, something kind of related to that type approach. It's also related to the particle box idea um, that we can use to understand that going to the infinite limit. Thank you, Doctor. That help? Yep. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. So, as I said, we've got this guy tailing the red shifting, which makes sense from this part of the box <coughs> idea. Um, but it does tail off and stop shifting very much as we go out. And I should point out by the way, by doing a, a seven work of this, it's a lot of atoms. That's an expensive calculation. That Processors on a supercomputer takes three and a half days.
things or something. So. Ideally, we'd never have to go out that far to see it tail off. We have a better way of doing things. So, I've artificially broadened this thing, as I said, and that kind of is taking into account the finite temperature. That at finite temperature, and this isn't a perfectly optimized chain, it's got some wiggles, and that's going to shift the gap around a little bit. And so a given transition will have moved, and that's what the broadening is. Um, you see here that I, I've broadened it by 0.15 electron volts, if you want to think about the Gaussian's width. Um, that's the whole width of half mass of the Gaussian. <clears throat> I picked that because for everything I do that's auto-generated by my, my computer stuff that I'll tell you about, because this is roughly the kind of magnitude of the fall off you tend to see in polymers that people have made in, in the literature. So it's a completely made up number that just gets me a shape that lets me stare at my calculations and compare them by eye to stuff that people have published. So to go beyond that, what you have to do is actually start packing the molecules together, allow them to relax and do everything. Um, and that gets very expensive to calculate the excited states for the molecule and that many confirmations. So I cheat. Good question. So how many ex excitations? This is the uh, 12 lowest excitations. So you'll see with this n equals 7, it kind of tails off here. Because I've run through my dozen excitations, but I still have some stuff that, that would be out in UV and just, yeah, it's not in there. And that, that's a decision I had to make for, for computational efficiency purposes. A few times I, I've had really interesting structure here run out of my window, and then I have to go back and do more excitations. Okay, so so what? Um, I've got these, these spectra. It'd be nice to know if this has anything to do with, with what we see in real systems, because this is about trying to figure out whether this 631 G star V3 lip density functional theory with time-dependent density functional theory approach is the right one, um, or a right one. So before I, I get to that, I should point out that I, I'm plotting here now the calculated homo energy for my molecule as a function of number of units, as well as the calculated lumo energy. And this blue curve is what I call the optical lumo. I think I stole that term from uh, I may have said that a few years ago. All this blue curve is is the homo energy plus the first excited state energy. So I just wanted to plot it as well and so along the same curve. These curves that pass through the, the data are not fits. They're extrapolations based just on the first two points. So I have n equals 1's energy levels, n equals 2. That's enough information to fit a Hubble-like model um, that lets me extrapolate and figure out roughly what the infinite chain energetics are going to be. <clears throat> it's very convenient because I don't have to go out to get into seven, which gets really expensive. Um, there are some details. Sometimes it proves useful to go to equals four because you can get a slightly more advanced version of the, the extrapolation. But uh, I may talk about that at the end. Okay, so this tail off we see, by the way, if you plotted this versus 1 over n, which is the classic thing that people plot, um, <coughs> the expectation is often that if you plot properties versus 1 over the number of units or 1 over the chain length, you get a straight line that goes in to your infinite value. And this thing actually comes in as a straight line only if you plot it as 1 over n squared. Things converge a lot faster, according to this model, than a 1 over n model would suggest. Um, all of the 1 over n models that I'm aware of are based on kind of nearly free electron arguments. And this model is based on arguments that say, I have a molecule, and it's coupled to a whole other molecule, and the electrons on, on one molecule are localized. So they're not nearly free. So it's it remains to be seen whether this, this version of the model is um, fully consistent with the experiment. It seems to be. Oops. 
So this is where kind of the rubber meets the road, as far as I'm concerned. I, I went in and grabbed points from the published paper on this material, and that's the absorption spectrum. And then I just threw the n equals 4 predicted spectrum on there. The reason I did n equals 4 for this plot was because that's all that had finished running at the time. So 5, 6, and 7 redshift a little bit, and I just read it here. But this looks fairly good. I mean, the, the onset, whatever that means, isn't too far off. Although, frankly, I arbitrarily chose a width for, for broadening it, so the onset had better be pretty good. Uh, more importantly, as far as I'm concerned, is the fundamental thing where I had no freedom, which is the peak of the first excited state. That first excitation energy is right near the peak. Um, of the absorption spectrum. This comes to a point that I think dovetails with, with what Paul was talking about. Um, people who report that the gap in tables, the absorption, the optical gap, are having to pick something out here, and I have no idea how to do that. But I can always point to the first peak, the reddest peak. And so my inclination is to probably say, you should do that if you're reporting things. That has the advantage of corresponding to the optimized geometry, gas phase calculation for the absorption of the molecules. So it makes it easier from my point of view to compare uh, to experiment. You might be wondering what's going on with all of this stuff. Um, this is a uh, spectrum taken from the film. So you have molecules packed on top of each other, their geometry is not quite the same, and so things. Uh, and this does not include PCBM or anything in that absorption. This is just the film. Um, another final thing to point out is that it's, it's kind of interesting that this peak is fairly close to what I calculate. Because one of the things is this is an isolated molecule, and the experimental result that I'm showing is for a film. And what you typically expect when you put materials into the film is they start to pack on top of each other. A couple of things can happen. One, they can flatten out a little bit shutting on each other. So you expect them to redshift a little bit. The other thing is the, the pi electrons on one chain mix with pi electrons on the other, and so you get even more delocalization, and so you redshift. And yet here is this gas phase calculation that seems to show degrees pretty well in the experiment. And I think the reason for that, go back a few slides, is because of that. They don't pack very well. And so put them into the film, and they're not going to stack all that much, is, is the hypothesis. And because they're not going to stack very well, the gas phase result is going to be pretty close to the uh, result for uh, the, uh, the film. That's a hypothesis. I'm guessing. I don't know that for sure. But I thought it was interesting when I first kind of started plotting these things. Ross? Yeah. Is it the stairs between the fluorine and the proton that gives you the twist? Let's go back to the structure. The fluorine? Oh, it's a uh, benzo dye, ions, whatever, BT. Yeah. That thing? Um, the, the, the fluorine atom. Largely, atoms. yes. And, and, and if you look at the, the twist does not happen uniformly. Um, it kind of really happens at, at, at a, I think, right around here. If you look, you've got kind of the sulfur and the sulfur talking to each other um, because this sulfur is opposite to that sulfur, so it's, it's closer to this one. Um, <coughs> you go over, over here where the sulfurs are actually near each other, which you would think would be energetically bad, but sterically it's pretty good. And uh, so there's some disorder there. One of the things that, that I'm you know, running friendly, hostile discussion some chemists is the belief is that the sulfur should always be opposite each other. And across a lot of different basis sets and different functionals, I find that often having the sulfurs next to each other, um, if there's an oxygen on the other side, is somehow more stable. I don't understand that yet. And the, the chemists with whom I'm discussing it um, are hostile about the fact that they don't understand it and I don't understand it. But I, I think it's a steric thing that actually has something to do with these sulfurs talking to each other in an interesting way. Yeah. 
All right, so this is one example of something that at the very least should, I hope, convince you that if that's a coincidence, it's an awful lucky one because this is one of the first things we should look at. Um, uh, I should have chosen different colors, sorry. Um, that says why no homo and lumo values. I didn't report the homo and lumo values. I guess I showed them to you. Maybe you can ask Paul. Um, there are measured homo and lumo values in that paper that I could compare to the calculated results. But um, I don't know how they got those values. They didn't write down everything that they did. So <laughs> um, it's, it's hard for me to compare. They, they, they seem to be pretty close within 0.1 electron volts. Um, but again, I don't know what they did, so I can't even compare to that. Um, before I, I go into this, I, I will comment on, on something. Go back to the level of agreement, or at least reasonable agreement we see here. Um, one of the, the things I've got going that I'm going to talk about is a large data set, a huge number of molecules that we've kind of automatically generated and, and calculated the results of. And one of my hobbies is every couple of weeks I look through the literature and see if anyone's published any of the ones I've already calculated. Because we've calculated far more than we can synthesize at NREL. And um, almost without fail, I would say actually without fail, um, the published absorption spectra really match very well with the calculated absorption spectra. And I'm almost within about 100 to maybe 150 milli electron volts on whatever values they, they get from their home. So, um, for whatever that's worth. But this absorption spectrum, where you don't have a lot of fudge factor, it's really astonishing how well this time dependent DFT does. Um, and I think the reason for that is that with these delocalized pi electrons, you've got pi to pi star transitions that, one, don't care too much about the functional. Because all the stuff that's really in the nitty gritty of the functional doesn't matter. Um, and two, that transition is going to be very single excitation in character, which is a fundamental limitation of the time dependent density functional theory. So it's a sort of fortuitous, the, the methodology is almost tailor made for this kind of molecule, which is, is a nice um, bonus. So, so these. This set of molecules also not include a lot of cases where you charge transfer character in these types of Right. Um, so those in the back, he said this this set of molecules also includes not a lot of cases where there's charge transfer character in the excited state. It is hard for me to be super unequivocal about that, because if there is charge transfer character in the excited state, my method won't pick it up, and so my calculation would suggest there's not. <laughs> Um, but given the clear agreement with the experiment just across the board, people publish something and I go, oh, I've already calculated that. And it, it seems to match very well, so that's um, it's at least a good sign. I should put together one of those graphs that shows all of the different things for all the molecules that have been published, but I started a little bit too late, and it's sort of daunting at this point. I don't want to go through it all. Um, all right, so. The other thing we needed to talk about, or I had mentioned, was that it's not just the electronic structure, although it seems like we're doing a good job of that in terms of the absorption factor, but the geometry matters too. And I think that geometry that we calculated for the PBT7, PTB7, excuse me, um, material, at least gives us an explanation for why there wasn't a big redshift when we went to the, from solution to film. But you know, we also have this material that I've calculated the structure for. By the way, I'm reporting the calculated homo levels for these two things for a reason. So this guy, the homo's pushed up a little bit. So then from that, from that, you know, um, because of this aromatic resonance that's available with that six-membered ring, the gap's a little bit smaller for, for this molecule. But importantly, this thing's not very plain. So I have a, a prediction. And I'm super pleased because um, the calculations have been done before this was synthesized. And a group of us in the synthetic people, Wayne Browniker, who made this, and there's a lot of toe check, the other thing that comes. Our prediction was that 
if we measured the HOMA levels, would be shifted up a little bit. The absorption spectrum would be red shifted. Um, and then I, I we, we talked about it more, and I realized, well, I don't actually know what the measured HOMA level is. We don't know if we're doing the voltammetry exactly right every time. But the CV gives a trend of about 80 to 100 millielectron volts difference, which is good. But more importantly, if the HOMA levels here are different, we need a third arm, which I don't have. So suppose this is the LUMO of the fullerene. This is the HOMO of the uh, bottom molecule. And that's the HOMO <laughs> of the other one. We should expect that the open circuit voltage for the molecule that's on the upper side of things should be a bit bigger than the open circuit voltage for the other molecule because the HOMO is just very slightly lower. So that's one prediction. The other prediction we would make looking at this, I have to emphasize, we, we kind of hand waved our way through all of this before we made the measurements, is the lower one doesn't pack very well. So I bet it's going to have a lower electron mobility, which means you're going to get less current out. The current in that uh, solar cell is going to be not as good. Well, here's what we have. So the red is the JV curve for this guy. The green, and if you're a red green colored line, I apologize. This is the default on this. The green um, shows less short circuit current, which is consistent with that packing hand waving argument. And the open circuit voltage is greater. And this has got to be kind of luck. But it's about 80 millivolts <laughs> there. But but like, the trend is there, and that's really kind of a nice thing. It's, it's again, more evidence that this type of calculation, that's pretty straightforward to do. So you can use, if you've got the computer power available, you can use these package programs to calculate homo and levels, look at the structure, and make qualitative predictions. And in all of this, I have yet to put any molecules together and actually make a film. The reason for that is that's really expensive, it's hard, you don't know if your force fields are going to be correct for conjugated materials. And so this is all about kind of getting just enough information from the calculations to, to decide whether or not to go ahead and make the next material. So I think that, I hope that at least gives you some reason to believe that the, the, the methodology is reasonable. Um, before I go on and talk about some of the new stuff that, that we, we do at NREL, are there any questions? Any back questions? When you did a CPDFC on Yang 7% bombers, you showed the homo of the homo orbitals. Were those actual orbitals or cone sham orbitals? Those are cone sham orbitals. That's a great question. Um, uh, those were cone sham orbitals. There's reason to believe that the cone sham orbitals do have physical meaning, even though technically, any linear combination of that with other orbitals is, is the same thing. You know, the reason to believe just kind of has to do with all well, the transition dipoles seem to work and, and stuff like that. Okay, that's, so if the constant orbitals do, they overlap with the homo you can kind of safely say that the actual molecular orbitals will overlap? Yes, yeah, so the, the, the interesting thing is so you said the actual molecular orbitals would overlap. Using that language assumes that correlation is weak enough that a a single kind of set of orbitals description is right. Um, it's, it's a language we can't avoid. But um, the other thing is that the, the, the method of calculation itself calculates the transition dipoles largely independent of what the, the cone sham orbitals are. So if you do the rotation that mixes the, the cone sham orbitals, um, you leave the transition dipoles for your excited states on Question? Um, in this, uh where you had the <coughs> alpha, where you expected the alpha to be in the opposite direction. In the opposite direction, did you did you uh, include uh, hydrogen bonding in the calculation? Yes, the hydrogen bonding is 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 included in the calculation automatically, um, okay. because you know 
you've got a proton there and it, you can... It just blew away. It's way up. Because of the fluorine? Yeah. Um, that is in there. I did some calculations where I deliberately turned things and then let it relax but kept it. And in every case, the energy slightly went up if I had the sulfurs away from each other in that way. Um, yes, because if there's a hydrogen at this moment, maybe they make a hydrogen. It's a, so she, if you can't hear, she's, she's wondering, if because of the hydrogen, whether there's a hydrogen bond that's involved, and that's part of the stabilization. It very well could be. Um, and, and just to kind of help myself be a little bit confident mm -hmm. in the, the black box, you know, I did stuff like add basis functions and make sure I, I piled some extra polarization functions on top of the, the hydrogens. And I, did, I did play those games, and I kept getting the same answer, which I still don't exactly understand. It's a good problem. How do you derive the JV curve? I did not derive the JV curve. That's experimentally measured. So, um, one of the things that would be my dream, well, a small dream, a science dream, would be to be able to go from these calculations to packing the molecules together, figuring out transfer intervals so I get whole transport properties, figuring out how the whole system combines with fullerenes, do that whole thing, put a field on it, drive charge, like it, really simulate the whole system. And, yeah, they think that's, uh, that would be pretty heroic to pull that off. And people are working on the different pieces, but um, as I said, so I've, I've extracted a very small part of the problem that I think we can make progress on right now. So, how am I doing with the time? Cool. So, one of the things we've been doing at, at MRL, and it's, it's not unique to us, is really trying to explore lots and lots and lots of potential materials. And the reason we decided to do this was because uh, for, for a short period of time after I arrived at NREL, the chemist would come to me and say, I think I can make this. And I would calculate its properties and would say, hey, that's worth trying to make, or no, I don't bother making it. Um, but the calculations were sufficiently slow that every now and then they could make it before I finished which is pretty rare, because these are not easy to synthesize, as we saw from uh, the talks earlier. Um, there were enough cases where what we were all positive based on our intuition was going to be a great material, came out with like, a terrible geometry, a bad band gap, and the energies were all wrong, that um, I decided, well, I don't know anything about this. My intuition is clearly wrong. Um, intuition of the synthetic chemist was stronger, but still, we, we kept kind of having all these misses for stuff that we thought would be good. I thought, well, with this donor acceptor copolymer idea, there are so many possible combinations out there in the world, we should just try them all and do it before we have to do the synthesis. So we have set up a combinatorial generation thing that currently has a bit over 100,000 materials that we've calculated the, the properties of. Um, we're not the only people to do that. Um, a screw music group at, at Harvard uh, has used the uh, open source computing at home style uh, computing to compute properties of tons and tons and tons of molecules using a slightly different formulas than we use. Um, Jeff Hutchison at, at the University of Pittsburgh is actually doing something like this, which is, is fairly clever as well in that in addition to combinatorially combining building blocks, he has a genetic algorithm that searches the space and breeds things um, and, and has, has learned some clever things. Uh, one of them were the interesting results that came out of his thing. Was <coughs> his results suggest that a really good thing to do is have stuff that looks like donor, 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 acceptor, 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 donor, 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 donor. So blocks. And so I it was definitely perked up when uh, I saw this synthetic thing this morning where Mark was talking about block copolymers and stuff. And uh, it's something that we're not exploring, but it's, it's nice to have that out there and combine our results. Um, as I said, we're using all slightly different formalisms, each of which we've kind of independently vetted against experiment. And so at this point, um, I seem to be okay. Now, for the Harvard project, I will point out, this is a, a older paper. 2001. In green, we have what they finished. Yellow. You know, they got 26 different molecular fragments.
that their chemists in uh, Jeanne Bao's group told them, work with these. And then they're putting them together in all the possible ways that they can think of for these copolymers. And then there's a whole bunch of great, great computer science making machinery. Um, this is what that set looks like. So you've got some heterocycles and various six-membered rings with one or more nitrogens, and five-membered rings with selenium or sulfur, and here we've got carbon. And, um, this, this MG is not, in fact, magnesium. That's a, so they know they're not going to make any molecules with magnesium. So this is a little tag that their computer program notices and says, oh, I can take you off and make a bond there. <laughs> so we can basically, it almost treats these as leaving groups. And you know, we tie things together by doing this stuff. So this is their, their set of materials, and they've made a whole bunch of things, and um, there's some interesting results in the data. We took a slightly different approach than, than either the Harvard group or, or Hutchison. Um, we put together a set of donors and acceptors, and there's about 40, closer to 50 actually, of each type. And these are things that either have been described in the literature, or our chemists are really certain they can make, or kind of certain they can make, or I said, hey, why don't I change that carbon to the silicon? And you know, so we have just this set of, of things that are likely to be made, and what we do is we put them together in interesting ways. Uh, one of the things you'll notice, I've got these little X's here. That's my notation for where we can tie things together, where the bonds can happen. But I also have R groups that hang off. And this is actually something that we do that's a little bit different than the other groups. They typically replace the different things that you can put off the hanging off of the backbone with hydrogens. Because the idea is that you don't change the electronic structure that much. Um, what we have found is that you can, in fact, change the electronic structure. Like the hydrogen and a methyl group even quite a bit different in terms of like the methyl is willing to push electrons into that way to make more of a donor. Um, so I guess I, I would be remiss. We kind of built our own combinatorial structure generator. And the way we did that um, was maybe less clever than it could have been. It literally we have a, an XYZ file with these coordinates. And that is actually a hydrogen hanging off, but it's got a little tag right next to the hydrogen that says, I can be replaced by a functional group. And our code grabs the thing, puts them together. These two carbons say, get put 1.44 angstroms apart, which is about carbon carbon single bond. Um, we do a little bit of this to get things not, atoms not overlapping if, if we've got things hanging off. Um, and then we start to decorate these things. It's such a kind of, I don't want to say bonehead, but it, we didn't use a lot of the fancy machinery you can use with smile strings and other things. Um, and that has made us very flexible. When we decide to change things about what's going on, it's literally just a matter of saying, oh yeah, by the way, take that carbon and move it a little bit. And so it's, it's given us the ability to respond quickly to, to things we've discovered. Um, here's a subset of the donors that we have in our library. You see that's not the same as as the materials that are in, in the Harvard groups. Um, you know, we've got the carbazole, fluorine, this is that, benzodiathiazole material, and some other things. Um, that this is a diethanyl pyrrole, I think we call it, DTP. Um, and so we start putting these things together with some of our acceptors. We've got ones that are known for the literature like DPP, this TPD, which is that thing that um, was associated with the, the results I showed you just a few minutes ago, um, this guy, which we saw with the PTP7. So we have all of these things. Um, in addition, we can put different substituents on. These were chosen based on organic chemists saying, um, this is going to be really electron drawing, this is going to be electron donating. We wanted a range of chemist would call it the Hammond Sigma parameter. We also have more than these four things. We can, we can put on phenyl groups and, and hang biofeeds off and do various things that we do to functionalize. Um, this is just an example of something that gets made automatically by our, our combinatorial generator. All it does is go 
through them say, one, donor one, two, donor two, donor two, et cetera. You get to donor five, meanwhile it's going through acceptors, and you can say acceptor two, and it puts them together, auto-generates all of the scripts to run the electronic structure, shoves it on the computer, and runs it. Um, this is something that, that we discovered from our database that, that fairly early on that I think is interesting, and I'm still not entirely sure what to make of it, but I know that the result, the result is robust. So, what I'm showing here, these gray points are points of the HOMO value and the energy gap for, I think, the first 20,000 or so materials that we calculated. And the green ones are all of the ones with D5 and acceptor 2, with all of the different substituents that you can put on these things. So, you know, you imagine going from this methyl group to uh, an alkoxy or an ester or a ketone, you're going to be moving the homo and lumo levels of that material around, of that monomer. Similarly, changing the, the things here to move that monomer around. The donor acceptor picture tells us that, you know, the lumo of our combined guy, or the gap, is going to be determined if I pull the lumo down, the gap should get smaller. That's not what happens. As I run along here, and I, as I pull the homo down, this is going deeper to the left. The gap doesn't get bigger as I, I do that. What happens is, I pull the homo down, and for the combination, it says, great. And they both go down together. Um, this is robust across most of the pairs of things that we pick. Messing with the acceptor, you would think, would change the lumo, but it changes them both. There's a subset of materials for which that's not the case. And those are the ones that have a steric interaction, so the donor acceptor are like this. So they're not talking to each other anyway. Um, so what this tells us, in, in fact, is that the design principle, the idea of moving the acceptor around, kind of the LUMO independently of the HOMO, is only going to work for materials that are not going to absorb light at all well because the HOMO and LUMO are localized on different parts of the material. So um, just having this data set, being able to do this for a bunch of different donors and acceptors, and see this flat line across the board, it's sort of interesting. You may notice this outlier. Um, there was one uh, thing you could put on the donor that was pulled you down deep enough that it actually shot the gap up. Um, and lo and behold, when you did that, it localized the limo on the acceptor. So I, I just think that's kind of So, kind of to summarize, in case I'm out of time, do I have, am I dead or five minutes or dead? <laughs> so, this, this formalism that we developed does compare well to experiment. I only showed you like two examples. I didn't show you all of the stuff for, for those two examples. But across the board, when we have new materials that get published or that we make, we see very good agreement between the calculations and the, the experimental results. That gives us um, you know, very good confidence to be able to look through our database and say, you know what, let's find materials that have a homo here and a gap here, and we can, we can look for only those materials in our 100,000 molecule database that can simultaneously get the low band gap, high lumo, low homo. And what we're finding is a, a bunch of materials that, that pop out of there that look like they should be really good, and we're in the process of synthesizing them, and, and a couple of times so far, uh, we've started the process of synthesizing them, and then someone has published that they did it, and the materials are coming out. Good. Um, what's in this database is not just polymers. Um, we also have done some small molecule things, uh, kind of inspired by some of what's going on in Australia. And uh, the, the design principles are somewhat similar, but you can, you can do a lot more with small molecules um, quickly on the computer. And uh, so we saw that the push-pull model really doesn't quite work to describe these things. What's nice about that is that might mean that a more sophisticated kind of Huckle kind of deal with conjugation model uh, might allow this stuff to go faster. I just don't know how to do that yet. 
Finally, there are a ton of materials in this database that would be like the worst material in the world you could do for OPD. Like a big band gap, the energies are all off, but they would make awesome organic life <coughs> diodes. They'd be really good as interfacial things that provide good contact between a metal and another material. So that would be a nice thing that we're currently kind of exploring. Um, taking advantage of the fact that we made a whole bunch of things, most of which are lousy for OPV. We might as well look at them and see if they're good for anything else. And uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge um, Peter Graff and Craig Swank put together a lot of the software that auto-generates molecules. We were able to do the 100,000 molecule calculations. Um, which is really several hundred thousand when you take into account the different oligomers, because we have access to what I think is still the only supercomputer in the world that's dedicated solely to renewable energy calculations. At least we like to say that. Um, this is a experimentalist and synthetic chemist uh, work on this project and have really helpful discussions and help with the uh, science, all along at the University of Denver, Sean. So um, thank you for your attention, please. I'd, I'd love to have, have some discussion. criteria we use are that we want the band gap to be such that you're going to absorb the solar spectrum really well. In fact, we have these, these spectra that we predict, right? I showed that. We can overlap that with the solar spectrum. We integrate it and really get the real absorption by the molecule. So we want that to be a big number. Um, at the same time, we want this HOMO to be fairly low um, because we'd like to have a large VOC and we've sort of decided that low homo means about minus 5.2 electron volts um, with good absorption. <clears throat> we want the excited state of energy to be high enough that we think we can split the excitometer before it. So kind of a, it's, it's a very empirical rule of thumb ideas, but we've got this huge database and we have a little uh, web app that you, you, you log into and uh, you just slide bars and say, Oh, only show me the molecules that have this this range of homos and this absorption spectrum and everything else, and all of a sudden you're from 100,000 molecules down to 500 molecules, and then you say, well, only show me the stuff that contains components that we have on a shelf in the lab already, and that takes the 500 down to 20, and so that's that's kind of the criteria we use. Our um, first, the energetics. Second, um, do we have the ability to make it quickly? And then third, uh, what the chemists really, the organic chemists think they can really make. So does the model also show the extinction coefficient of the material? Yes. So when we calculate, for example, these predicted absorption spectra, that really gives us the extinction coefficient for the material according to the predictions. Um, and it does actually match pretty well uh, when compared to experiment. The, the few papers that you can find where people publish the, uh, the absorption spectrum and they don't say arbitrary units and make the peak one, um, the, the numbers are about right. So you showed a diagram where the low and low energies um, sort of flatten out after that four. Is that because the, the, the program you running uh, takes into account the kind of, the kind of correlations and says that they decreases over distance. Or does it take into account the distance length that you might expect to see in a 
randomly firing to comma line. So, you know, it's after you get to a certain amount of units, you know, a certain amount of twists, at that point you can actually be effectively breaking the combination. Right. So there are those kind of two fields of thought. Right. I, I do not believe it's because of the correlation, um, per se, because I notice things localize more um, as, as a function of twist. And these are locally optimized geometries, and they don't have any, any real motion to them. But it's effectively a one-dimensional problem. And so it doesn't really take much disorder to localize you. And I think that's what we're looking at. Um, you know, the model itself, which we talk about, um, is a very simple A is coupled to B is coupled to C. Solve the matrix problem and get the, the three thing. It looks beautiful. So my guess, though, is it's the, the fact that these guys are not planar. That's another important thing. Something not the people who, like Hutchison and, and the Harvard group, like named, but there are people out there who, who forcibly make all of the polymers that they calculate planar. And that way they can do periodic boundary conditions and go to the infinite limit really easily. But they're missing anything that, that isn't, anything I guess you'd say molecular at that point. Um, so I, I personally think that's a good idea. Any questions? Yeah, Thanks for your attention. I'm going to take a 10 minute break and we'll start at 20 after. Okay.